I did a video a couple weeks ago and we talked about the heart and that prompted a lot of questions. And I wanna come back and answer a lot of those questions right now. But please listen to the rhythm you hear. That's the rhythm I want to hear when I'm seeing a patient. I want to hear that regular lucked up, and that's why we use a stethoscope. So as physicians, typically, if someone comes in with a question about their heart and concerned about what's the potential that my heart might stop, why does it happen? Well, who's next? Am I at risk? Again, if you go back to this model, you'll remember that we've got the vessels. You see the red vessels, that's the plumbing. You've got the whole of the heart. It's clear see-through, that's the muscle. And then embedded within the muscle wall is the electrical system. We call them Purkinje fibers. Basically, the electrical impulse starts at the top of the heart in the atrial tissue goes down to the midpoint of the heart. And from there, that electrical impulse is distributed to the lower part of the heart, causing a contraction. That contraction forces blood out through our aorta into the body, up into the brain. So again, I think part of the reason my previous video spurred so much attention was because perhaps of this quote from C.S. Lewis, he says, you never know how much you really believe anything until its truth or falsehood becomes a matter of life and death to you. I want to say that again. You never know how much you really believe anything until its truth or falsehood becomes a matter of life and death to you. That's uh, from a book I wrote called uh, We've Been Played uh, that can be obtained at drscottjensenbook.com, D-R-S-C-O-T-T-J-E-N-S-E-N-B-O-O-K.com, drscottjensenbook.com. But let's again talk about the three pieces. We talk about the coronary arteries. That's the plumbing. We talk about the heart muscle. That's the muscle that does the contraction. And then we talk about the electrical system. What many people have concerns about these days is the issue of the heart stopping. I got an email earlier today where someone says, do I understand this correctly? The heart stopping isn't its own event. It's always following basically the dying process caused by something else. That's not true. Actually, the heart stopping, cardiac arrest, can be its own isolated phenomenon. That, in fact, is why right now, across the planet, people are very concerned about what is the number of people experiencing primary cardiac arrest. Cardiac arrest. Cardiac is heart. Arrest is stoppage. So the heart stops pumping. You can have a cardiac arrest and still have electrical activity looking quite normal. Oftentimes, we used to call it electromechanical dissociation, where we would see a regular QRS wave, which is part of the EKG, part of the electrical system. It would just keep bumping along very nicely, but there was no contraction. The heart had stopped. So a lot of people want to, how can I check this out? What can I do? That's tough. So let's first talk about the plumbing. This is a typical report that I get in regards to testing out the plumbing. Oftentimes we will do a cardiac catheterization. So that's an angiogram. We'll go maybe in the groin or the radial artery. We feed a catheter up into the heart, inject some dye, take some pictures, and we'll find out on this anatomy where the blockage is. Sometimes a stent will be put in place right then and there. So you not only have a diagnostic test, you have a therapeutic test. That's been a tremendous advance, a tremendous advance in medicine. And cardiologists are extremely skilled. And Minnesota is fortunate to have so many skilled cardiologists doing this procedure. So that's the plumbing system. 
We're checking out the coronary arteries. We do an angiogram. There's other tests that we can do as well. Sometimes we'll order a CAT scan angiogram. It's also called a CTCA, a CAT scan coronary angiogram. And that's injecting a dye into the vein and taking pictures. We don't have access to the coronary vessels. So when we do a CTCA, we do not have the ability to slide a stent in place. So we can't provide the therapy at the same time. A CTCA doesn't carry the risk of a standard invasive angiogram. An invasive angiogram where we put a catheter in through the groin arteries or through the radial artery, there's a 1% risk of stroke or heart attack typically with that procedure. With the CTA, a CTCA where we're doing it with a dye in the, in the uh, antecubital vein, uh, typically uh, the risk is quite minuscule, uh, potentially reacting to the dye, and that's not very common. So that's how we check the plumbing. But we're not talking about plumbing because with, when the plumbing is bad and there's obstruction, that's when you get the chest pain, the elephant standing on your chest, nauseated, sweaty, burning up to your chin, weak, faint. It comes on with exertion. It gets better with rest. That's checking out the plumbing. Then we want to be able to check out the muscle. Well, the muscle has a job to do. And the muscle has to contract and squeeze blood to the whole body. Typically, we measure the function of the muscle by way of an echocardiogram. With an echocardiogram, we like to see the ejection fraction, which is the amount of blood in the ventricle that gets pumped forward with each contraction. We like that number to be 55% or more. In days gone by, I'm old enough to remember when we'd get an ejection fraction in someone who was seriously ill with a very compromised heart. And we used to think that an ejection fraction of less than 25% was barely compatible with life. But quite frankly, a lot of progress has been made. And I do have patients that can have an ejection fraction of 20% or even a little less and they can still sustain life, though they're clearly compromised. But the echocardiogram is often the best way for us to check the muscle. And connected to the muscular tissue of the heart are the valves, and there's four of them. And when we do an echocardiogram, we're looking at the function of the heart muscle and its ability to contract, but we're also looking at the function of the valves. So that's how we look at that. But what a lot of people have concerns about today, especially with spontaneous, collapses and deaths of otherwise relatively young, healthy people. People are very concerned about this. We've seen it in the news. We've seen it on TV. We're talking then about the electrical system. If a person has a cardiac arrest, stoppage of the heart, because the plumbing is blocked up, we'll try to deal with the plumbing so that that cardiac arrest won't happen again. If a person is having has a cardiac arrest because the muscle isn't functioning, frequently that's a myocarditis kind of situation where the myocardial muscle is inflamed and oftentimes compromised and not able to do the contracting that we want it to do. And frequently the irritation and the inflammation coming from the myocarditis can trigger an electrical event which results in a variety of different rhythm disturbances. But sometimes it'll be a cardiac arrest, particularly if it devolves into a ventricular fibrillation. EKGs are real good for us to get a basic reading on how a person's rhythm is doing. Now, there's a variety of articles recently talking about the various rhythm disturbances that might come from either having COVID disease or having had the COVID vaccine. Uh, there was one article recently that talked about a phenomenon called torsade de pointe. And uh, that's uh, been reported following vaccines uh, for COVID-19. Uh, but that's a relatively uncommon one. And most people don't know about torsade de points. But a quite common rhythm disturbance in the wake of COVID or COVID vaccinations is atrial fibrillation. And with atrial fibrillation, the heart rhythm is irregular. And it goes boop, 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 boop. Babu, which is quite a bit different than the rhythm I showed you at the beginning of this video. But recently, 
we've been doing more and more investigation of what is prompting this thunderclap cardiac arrest in the absence of no problem with the muscle. In other words, the ejection fraction was 55% doing okay. And there was no compromise in the plumbing. The plumbing was clear. There were no significant blockages, no significant plaque accumulations. What's going wrong with the electrical system in the heart that can cause a cardiac arrest? It's a huge issue. It's scary for all of us because quite frankly, we don't have the ability to predict who's next. We can do an EKG. We can do a Holter monitor where we put a, a device on a person and monitor their rhythm for a month. There are other recent technological advances that can be used. There's a link, a wire that can be put in uh, to the chest wall for a period of time, and we can monitor the rhythm there. But the rhythms that I have seen most following vaccination have been atrial fibrillation, PSVT, which is paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia, and I know that's a lot of syllables, but basically the top part of the heart causes a fast rhythm disturbance that can result in lightheadedness, dizziness, sometimes syncope or collapse, but doesn't generally devolve into V-fib, ventricular fibrillation, which is essentially cardiac arrest. But another one that we'll see is, we'll see ventricular tachycardia, where the bottom part of the heart starts malfunctioning on its own, and it overtakes the rhythm of the entire heart, and it doesn't allow an efficient rhythm to take place. But the biggest risk we have is that spontaneous occurrence of ventricular fibrillation, the heart stopping, no contraction going on. Why is this important? Well, this is an article that just came out within the last week, January 5th, 2023. This was out of Taiwan. It was measuring changes on the EKG after the vaccine, the COVID vaccine, in senior high school students. It's a study that was published on January 5th, as I mentioned, in the European Journal of Pediatrics. Let's just walk through this article because this is senior high students. Comparisons of EKGs and questionnaire survey were done before and after the vaccine. So before the vaccine was given, students would be queried, have you had symptoms of this, chest pain, palpitations, shortness of breath, lightheadedness, those kind of things. Also an EKG would be done to serve as a baseline. Then the vaccine was given. Approximately 5,000 students participated, 15 times as many boys as girls. In total, 763 students, or 17%, had at least one cardiac symptom after the second vaccination dose. Most often, it was either chest pain or palpitations. Palpitations is where you feel your heart beating, whether it's irregular or fast or prominent. When you're aware subjectively of your heart rhythm, that's generally considered a palpitation. Palpitations and chest pain were recorded in 17% of high school students after the second shot. Abnormal EKGs after the second shot were obtained in 1% of the students. And... I think that data had shown that one was diagnosed with myocarditis and four were judged to have significant arrhythmia or rhythm disturbance. The conclusion was this. Cardiac symptoms are common. Cardiac symptoms, that's you telling me what you're feeling. Chest pain, shortness of breath, lightheadedness, palpitations. Cardiac symptoms are common after the second dose. And this was the Pfizer vaccine. But the incidences of significant arrhythmias and myocarditis was only 0.1% which is one out of a thousand, one out of a thousand. Typically, if you just ask a physician, what's the normal frequency of myocarditis apart from COVID-19 disease or apart from COVID-19 vaccination? In the normal population, we expect myocarditis to be somewhere between one in 10,000 to one in 100,000, somewhere in there. 
So one in a thousand is definitely a significant increase. The EKG monitoring that was done during this test did reveal that there was high sensitivity and specificity for significant cardiac adverse effects. But we have to measure then cost. If we're going to go out and do EKGs before we vaccinate people and then after we vaccinate, what is the cost? Is it prohibitive? Those kinds of things. So this was a study that was done. And the definition of myocarditis that was used during this study was the CDC's working definition, which was this. You had to have, in order to diagnose probable myocarditis, you had to have one symptom or sign from the following. Chest pain, chest tightness, palpitation, or difficulty breathing. You had to have one of those. And you needed to have at least one abnormal test. And those tests included a blood test called a troponin, which is when heart muscle is injured, inflamed, or damaged. So a troponin test, or an abnormal EKG finding, or a decreased ejection fraction on an echocardiogram or a magnetic resonance image of the heart being abnormal. That was what was done. Typically in everyday medicine, the three that I use a lot would be troponins, which is a blood test, an EKG, which is easy to do in the office, and an echocardiogram, which is done in many centers, cardiac clinics, hospitals, uh, same-day surgeries, things like that. From the questionnaire, it was clear that 17% of kids had a significant symptom after the second dose. And the individual symptoms were generally chest pain, palpitations, or dizziness, or fainting. And again, after pre- and post-vaccine EKGs were done, 1% of students were judged to have had a significant EKG change after the vaccination. What kinds of EKG changes did we see? We saw rhythm disturbances. Sometimes the rhythm was fast, sometimes it was slow, sometimes it was out of the regular, the boop, 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 and instead it would be boop, 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 and you'd get that kind of a rhythm. Or you'd have a blockage of one of the electric conduits. It's called a bundle branch block. Or you'd see a prolongation of the amount of time it took for a heart muscle to be activated into contracting. 1.03% of kids had problems there. So what we saw with this was that the potential for a cardiac rhythm disturbance from the vaccine is very significant. It's 1%, which is significant. And the likelihood of a symptom at 17% is very significant. So here we're left with what can you do? What can you do to figure out whether or not you've got a problem? I had a new patient come to me yesterday and had had symptoms of chest discomfort for approximately 12 months after the second uh, vaccination dose. Young person. And we'll just say that the name was Pat. So Pat had symptoms. In evaluating Pat, I did a variety of tests. I did a test to check out white count, hemoglobin platelets. I'm checking kidney and liver. I also checked CRP, which is a measurement of inflammation. C-reactive protein is what it stands for. Also, a SED rate. ESR is another name for it. Erythrocyte sedimentation rate. But those are two inflammatory markers that I can easily check to see if there's a persisting inflammation in the body, potentially the heart. We did an EKG. That was normal. The next test would be an echocardiogram if we were going to do that. An EKG is maybe 50 bucks. An echocardiogram is probably closer to 1000 So again, we have to ask ourselves, cost, benefit. So in his situation, he had no evidence of any pump problems. He had no evidence of any plumbing problems. So then the question was, we're trying to evaluate whether or not he's at risk for a primary rhythm disturbance because of the electrical system. At one time, I would put together in our clinic cardiac screening for athletes. And this was a mini echo where I worked out an arrangement with an echocardiographer. 
and that person would go ahead and just do a very brief echocardiogram to make sure the four valves functioned okay and that the ejection fraction was okay. We didn't go any deeper than that. We would do EKG, echocardiogram, do a cholesterol, do blood pressure, ask a bunch of symptoms about dizziness, fainting, chest pain, heart murmur, things like that. That's one way to do it. Bottom line is what's really on my mind these days is the number of people that seem to be having a primary rhythm disturbance related to the electrical system of the heart. I'm not talking about people who have warning symptoms of chest pain or shortness of breath when they shovel or walk out to the mailbox. That would clearly indicate a plumbing problem. I'm not talking about people who come in to see me short of breath with big distended jugular veins and a lot of swelling in their ankle that might indicate that there's muscle pump function disturbance and the ejection fraction is not 55%. It might be 40% or 30%. What I'm talking about is that thunderclap cardiac arrest out of the blue in someone who has normal muscle function, normal plumbing, and still is at this risk. We don't have the answer. We don't have an antidote. We can't say if you do vitamin C and vitamin D, you'll reduce your risk of having a primary cardiac rhythm disturbance. Certainly, if you're having symptoms of electrical system malfunction in your heart, palpitations, feeling lightheaded or faint, feeling like your pulse is going too fast or too slow, other symptoms as well related to the cardiac function. You need to see your physician. We know that we can do for some people an ICD, an internal cardiac defibrillator, but we know we can't put that in everybody. We know that these are scary times because we're all asking the question, is my heart okay? Who next might see their heart stop? These are legitimate questions. And when you ask them, you are not being any kind of a conspiracy theorist. You're not being unreasonable. You're not being obsessive. You're not being a hypochondriac. You're asking very legitimate questions. This is one of those situations where we have to lean into science. And science, as I've said before, is the process of observing and then measuring and then creating a hypothesis and trying to determine whether or not our hypothesis is correct. As you can well imagine, trying to put together a hypothesis and then creating an experiment to confirm or deny the hypothesis is extremely difficult when you're trying to, if you will, laser focus on the risk of sudden cardiac arrest in the absence of anything else wrong with your heart, meaning that your muscle is functioning, that your plumbing is good, and there's no obvious electrical problem with your heart. This is a challenge for all of us. So I appreciate your engagement. I hope this helps. If you have a physician and you've got questions, you need to confer with your physician. Thanks.